Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Fourth Space Checking In series. We meet up with Patrick Leitany, Concordia's Public Affairs Advisor, to listen in on his conversations with Concordia researchers. This week, he sits down with Concordia researcher Stephanie Duguay and one of her co-authors, Christopher Dietzel, to discuss their new study published in the Journal of New Media and Society, looking at how dating apps were quick to adapt to the new limits placed on socializing during the pandemic. Thanks for listening. Before we just get started, this was really about sort of the first wave of the pandemic, right? When you looked at how sort of these eight dating apps really kind of changed how they work and, and sort of sort of leaned into the pandemic, I guess. Um, maybe if you want to just start with that and we can, we can get into it. Sure. Well, um, I'll give a little bit of context. I guess it was March 2020. And as dating app scholars, we were already on several of these apps for other research purposes. And we started to notice that as things shut down in Canada uh, and also abroad, um, many of these apps were also making shifts in the messaging that they were sending out to people. And then shortly after that, some of the features that they were promoting. Uh, And so we thought, well, (laughs) we're at home. (laughs) We're we're still working, working from home. And this is something very interesting. And this is a historical moment that if we don't start to look at what these apps are doing, how they're adjusting to the pandemic, then maybe nobody else will be doing that at this moment. So we started to collect the materials um, that app companies were posting to social media. And uh, we also uh, collected some in-app messages, right? Because some companies were sending their users direct messages in their apps. And we started to look at what features or functions um, were these companies changing in order to adjust to the pandemic conditions? Chris, do you want to add to that or is it? Uh... I mean, Steph said it beautifully. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, we were really, really interested in, especially since the premise of dating apps, uh, like dating apps appeal to users because of the idea that you can connect online, but then meet in person. And with the pandemic happening, of course, there have been uh, intense restrictions on how people can meet in person. Right. And so even just the premise of the apps, we thought it would be really interesting to see how the companies themselves respond to that, since it really challenged their entire business model. Uh, since now people couldn't meet, at least at that time, you know, it was very, very strict where people couldn't meet in person. So it was quite fun, I must add, you know, like it was it was a lot of data to sort through for sure. But it was it was really, really interesting work. And it's been quite fun to do the analysis since then. Yeah, it seems like the um, the apps really kind of, um, they took the pandemic and the health restrictions, they took it very seriously. You know, I mean, sort of, I think, I, I think what, by reading, by reading the paper, I found that like the tone of their communication tried to stay kind of light and, and friendly, but, you know, they weren't messing around with like the idea of, you know, this isn't that serious, go out and date and it's going to be fine. So can you, can you sort of, can we just go over the findings and sort of, Maybe explain to me sort of what what were some of the commonalities that you found amongst and if any were were particularly different or for sure. Well, before that though, I just want to pick up on something that you said, which was that they took it very seriously. And I think you know if you think back to March 2020, a lot of people were afraid. Um, there was a lot of unknown uh, in the situation, and so I think these apps needed to take this seriously. Uh, because there was a lot of media attention as well to, okay, we have to change the things that we do. We can no longer meet in person. And the apps themselves risked being attributed to the spread of COVID-19. And so we even see, you know, for example, uh, a Canadian health minister um, commenting and saying, if you get on Tinder or Grinder and you swipe right, you might get more than you bargained for, right? So right there, the apps are being implicated in this bigger public discussion that we're that we're having and so i think it would have been very strange if they had just stayed the course and said hey (laughs) swipe right and meet people um but instead they changed uh quite a bit so i don't know chris if you wanted to lead into some of our key findings yeah well just to build on that you know certainly the pandemic created uh an interesting context in which uh dating apps were implicated in the health of their users but there's been media public panic around uh, dating apps, sexual interactions, all that stuff for years. And so in that sense, yes, the pandemic has been completely new and posed <laughs> very novel challenges. But at the same time, scrutiny on the apps around the responsibility that they have to their users, certainly concerns about like 
heterosexual norms of dating, monogamy, casual sex, etc. There's been these sorts of moral panics for years and years. And so in that sense, those types of challenges were not unique to the pandemic. And we, we certainly reckon with that a lot in this paper. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add, Steph? <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, when it comes to meeting people through technology, people are afraid that they're going to get catfished, you know, that the people that they're meeting may not be as real as they seem. We even see that in, for example, the Netflix documentary that's hot right now, The Tinder Swindler. So people have been afraid of that for a long time. And then also casual sex has been stigmatized in our society for a long time. So when you have a technology where people are meeting other people that they don't previously know, and these technologies get associated with cultures of casual sex, then there's already quite a bit of panic surrounding these apps. Um, and so when you have a pandemic and people cannot meet in person, that heightens some of the panic because uh, one of the ways that dating apps really took hold was, okay, I'm going to match with you on the app, but then we're going to meet in person. And that's going to be a constraint on how deceptive you can be because <laughs> we'll go for coffee, I'll see your real height, I'll know what you look like, and then I'll, we can decide you know, whether we go from there with a relationship. And so we really see with the turn to meeting people online and during the pandemic staying online, the dating apps were very much creating a lot of messaging in order to make this feel safe, in order to make this feel comfortable. And one of the key terms that came out of this that a lot of the companies were using was this term of virtual dating uh, and calling virtual dating the new normal. But virtual dating is not what you would have thought in the 90s where people are, you know, just sending text messages back and forth or email messages. They're instead um, using video calling technology, right, as we've all become accustomed to being on Zoom. Some of these apps like Bumble have integrated video technology into their interfaces. And so what this does is it adds another layer that um, it's presumed that it's more difficult to be <laughs> deceptive over video. You get a better sense of the person. Even Match's video feature was called Vibe Check, right? So you're getting a vibe on the person and verifying that before you're meeting them in person. So those were some of um, the trends with the different messaging and the technology is that, hey, it, you know, you're meeting people, it's staying online. It doesn't mean that it's inauthentic. Yeah. And just to add on to that, you know, um, I think the dating apps, the companies themselves were really just like the rest of us were really trying to be creative in terms of how they, they held people, uh, held people's attention. Um, and so the term virtual dating certainly emerged within this time, but it, it's not unique again to the specific context of the pandemic. We have seen references to virtual dating and sometimes the title has been a little bit different, like online dating versus dating in real life. Like those themes have certainly been present in the past, but it was really, really interesting to see how the dating apps prescribed uh, like different norms for their users. So as Steph was mentioning, you know, like connecting through Zoom or uh, creating new services. But what we saw as well in particularly like on Instagram, where we collected some of our data is they had ideas for date nights. They talked about like going from one room to another, you know, uh, I forget what they said specifically, Steph and jump in. But I think they said like, the, the living room lounge or like the kitchen, you know, they had like creative names for the different rooms just to kind of like spice it up and say, you know, even if you're staying at home, you can think about this more creatively, more interestingly and kind of have fun with it. You know, they were really trying to, back to your question from a minute ago, Patrick, is that they were really trying to emphasize a lighter tone. Uh, and from a social media perspective, we saw that a lot in terms of the types of posts that they put on their Instagram. Yeah, the idea that the bedroom can be the glap ground or the bathroom is the spa. Um, and so yeah. the possibilities are endless. So it was interesting because, yeah, with this new sort of construction of virtual dating, there's not already a set of norms and practices for how uh -huh. to date through these apps during a pandemic um, when you can't meet up. And so there were all sorts of listicles and tips that they gave to users one of the key things that really caught our attention was the, the messaging around love and romance. And uh, some of the apps talked about the pandemic as perhaps the perfect time for love. And this mm -hmm. idea of returning to slow dating, almost you know, uh, alongside courtship practices, where you're meeting and you're taking it slow and you're having all these Zoom dates, and this precludes jumping into anything really fast. And it also 
um, precludes physical activity, right? And so moving again away from this association of dating apps with casual sex, here we have these apps saying, no, you can find romance, you can find a potential husband or wife in a pandemic through our apps. Um, And so we highlight that in the paper and we also problematize it because it, one, assumes that people put their sexuality aside (laughs) during a pandemic. And now after two years, you know, we should know that that's not a possible thing. Uh, Humans have sexuality. uh, It's part of life. Um, And two, because it really narrows the number of uses that these apps have, right? We know that people use dating apps to find friendship. We know that they use them for casual sex. We know that they use them for entertainment. And when you focus on romance and love and marriage, it really narrows down what people do with these apps and also reinforces heterosexuality and marriage and tradition as safe as restoring some sort of sense of safety in a pandemic. I think you write that this kind of new approach to traditional courtship and, and the ideas of relationships are very heteronormative, right? They're very like monogamous based and, and that sort of thing. Do you think um, do you think this is kind of a new conservatism, like not conservatism, like what we're seeing in downtown Ottawa, but like just kind of like a more constricted idea maybe of what these, these apps are for? I think... You know, these ideas around uh, heterosexual marriage and uh, like this ideal relationship that's been, it's been perpetuated throughout society. And so in that sense, I don't think it's anything particularly unique. And to build off what Steph kind of just said at the end of her last response is that, you know, these ideas can be very safe, very traditional. And I think in that regard, in, in a period of instability, you know, when we don't know what's happening, when we're trying to ground ourselves in something for many, many people, uh, they're trying to ground themselves in connection in relationships Uh, in emotional stability, right? And so if in light of this global crisis, they're able to ground themselves on these discourses that they're familiar with, and as well as like the goals that society has projected onto them for years and years and years, right? I think those few things come together to really uh, create this environment in which people feel that, yeah, this this is the perfect time for slow dating, for virtual dating. I can go back to my roots, go back to the ideals, you know, what worked for my parents in previous generations, you know, like we can make something of this opportunity. It doesn't have to be all a crisis. We can turn it into something that can work for us. So uh, in that sense, I don't, I don't necessarily see it as new conservatism. I, I see it as like a rebirth, a, a renaissance of the same ideas that have really been, have existed for many, many years, decades, but have just been packaged in this particular way to say like, Hey, here's some new challenges. Let's go back to what we know works. Yeah. And we do see these fluctuations, right? We have different discourses about casual sex um, become really popular in our society and then kind of less uh, and more over time. And right now I think we are seeing a really big surge in uh, people talking about casual sex in a negative way. And we see this also on television shows where you have, for example, Too Hot to Handle, where the whole point of the show is to not have sex all summer or love is blind where you're not supposed to base um, anything on looks or attraction and forge a deeper connection while you're talking to each other across pods. So we see in the popular discourse right now that there's a move towards these more traditional forms of relationships and valorizing them um, as opposed to uh, looking at casual sex as an opportunity for sexual expression Um, I think we can also attribute to this to a lot of longstanding sexual double standards, right? We like to think that, um, you know, with second wave feminism having taken place in history and and the assertion of sexual liberation, uh, we like to think that people can make their own choices about their sexuality and whether to engage in casual sex. Um, But a lot of the time, there's still attitudes that circulate that are stigmatizing towards casual sex and particularly punitive for women. Um, And so women get these messages that both say, hey, in order to be a strong woman and express yourself, uh, you should be, you know, uh, expressing yourself sexually, but then also they get messages around shaming sexually. And so we get, you know, a sort of fallout of that where people don't enjoy the casual sex culture that's going on because there's still so much stigma and shame circulating. And then these more traditional ideals seem to be, um, you know, like I said, valorized in, in relationship to that. So it's pretty, 
complex. Um, but again, I think it only show, shows one narrow view of what relationships and connecting with people can be like. Chris could also speak a bit to, uh, it, they don't, our findings about this don't appear in this paper, but we've been looking at the different messages that have functioned on Grindr and her and apps for queer populations that have put marriage and love less at the center of their pandemic messaging. Yeah, very much so. And that's the paper that we're working on right now. Uh, we've done a couple of presentations on it, but uh, we're finalizing our findings for this other paper. And as Steph noted, we really saw a big contrast between the messaging of these apps that were that are marketed for like heterosexual publics versus queer publics. And there was a much, much bigger emphasis on sexuality, on and not just sexuality in terms of like interacting with other partners, but even just like individual sexuality, how you can take care of your sexual needs at home. Uh, if you're using technology, if you're by yourself, you know, those, it was much more pronounced and in many ways, very, uh, very evident from the materials that we examined from the apps that are for like queer markets. And yeah, it was, it was just really, really interesting because, um, on, on one hand it was very surprising, but at the, on the other hand, it wasn't surprising at all that we saw that these these heterosexual apps were really reinforcing these ideas about marriage, about monogamy, about traditional values. It's, it's, it's quite interesting to see those, those distinctions. I guess just my, my last question would be about sort of going forward. I mean, lockdown restrictions are easing, socialization, where I'm assuming is going to increase in, over the course of the spring and summer. It seemed to me reading the paper that you think that a lot of the measures are going to stay in place, especially like the video interaction before meeting in, in real life. Is that something that you, you're you anticipating, that the pandemic has actually changed the nature of virtual dating? I think that a lot of the dating apps will keep these features and functionalities. You know, they've invested in the technology. They put the messaging out to people. And uh, as we've experienced, it can be very easy and seamless um, to connect via video conference and to initiate first connections through technology. On one side, this can be really helpful, right? It helps you to uh, sort through all of your matches. This is a key complaint that a lot of people have is, that, oh, I'm on the apps and I don't actually know who to meet up with. So it can help with that. It can help with accessibility. It can help to connect across distance if you're not able to meet up in the same location right away. Uh, but on the other hand, we also raise some potential issues um, about who can actually, you know, give a genuine uh, sense to the people that they match with over video call, right? You think about how maybe not everybody has surroundings that they can call from um, that make them feel comfortable, right? Or that would make their date feel comfortable. We're really again, raising the bar for, um, you know, uh, showing you, your inside home life before you've even met somebody. So that itself could have safety implications for people um, in trying to keep some of their details private while they're getting to know the people that they match with. So there's, there's complications to this, but I think it will stay with us for quite a while. I agree. And this is something that we wrote about at the end of the paper as well, is that whether or not the app companies continue to use the term virtual dating, these practices are going to be, I don't know, revised or repackaged in particular ways. And one of the examples that we gave at the end was with Bumble, which has already started to shift towards like slow dating as another phrase that they're that they're marketing uh, right now. So that, you know, if or when we go back in person, even if it's not going to be virtual, they can they can still project these values and project these practices to their users to encourage people to take it slow. In that regard, I mean, both in terms of virtual dating as well as if slow dating is a thing, we have to think about, again, the fact that these apps are companies, they're for-profit businesses. And so for them, it really is valuable to maintain their users, right? Of course, they want people to find a connection or a match and date, etc., but at the same time, they, they truly profit off of the fact that people are on their platforms, right? And so if this is virtual dating where people are spending more time in the app, if they're using the particular software that they've now developed to keep people even within just the parameters of their own app, or if they're now taking a slow approach to dating, then they might be using the app more. And whether that means more users or the amount of time that is spent online, you know, this, this maintains a public, uh, a market. For the, that the apps can can really profit off of. Uh, so I think that's important to know as well is not only were the apps able to kind of take advantage of, of this crisis and 
uh, imply or like repackage these ideas around heteronormativity and monogamous interactions and such. But it also allows them to emphasize the business aspect of their models and, and kind of play with what is available in this environment and how they can keep their users entertained. Yeah, the slower you go, the more time spent on the app, the more ads they can show you, the more data you give. So. So would you say that these apps had a good pandemic? A lot of their stats say that they, uh, they've they got more users and their usage is up, so. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. I think that's all I have to ask. If you have an idea for a podcast, please let us know. You can contact us by email at info4 at concordia.ca or find us on social media at CU Fourth Space. We'd love to hear from you. The Fourth Space podcast is hosted by me, Douglas Moffat, and produced with Anna Voklovec. Editing by Chanel Lees Marshall and Maximus Delmar. Social media and web support by Kari Balmstead. And our theme music, courtesy of Supercarmond. Thanks for listening.